This episode is sponsored by Babbel. Right here is an island called Christmas Island, because the person who named it first saw it on Christmas. Not that creative, but I suppose better than Today Island, and if you'd been distracted, might have been Yesterday Island, so not bad considering. Anyway, Christmas Island is home to, among other things, many species of crabs. And a number of those, like this red crab here, are land crabs. This means that these crabs have adaptations that let them live completely out of the water and in burrows on the inner parts of the island. With one caveat, <laughs> and it's a big one. Once a year, around the start of the rainy season, 65 of these crabs leave, sorry, 65 million of these crabs leave the interior of the island and head for the sea. These crabs are on a mission to get laid. And that means they'll climb fences and cross bridges, and they're not waiting for the crossing guard, I'll tell you that much. These crabs are protected by law, and cars even have special rings around their tires to push them out the way. The males will arrive at the coastline first, and dig breeding burrows, where they will meet with females and then turn right around and head home. Typical. Now the females will stay in their burrows for about two weeks while they brood their babies right on their bellies. When it is time, the females enter the water and... Blah, 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 blah. They gotta shake all the babies off. <laughs> the crazy thing here, okay, the other crazy thing here, is that these crabs lost the equipment to be in the water, so if they stay down there, they'll drown. Some serious risky baby making. The eggs hatch almost immediately on contact with the water, and little crab larvae emerge. This is the only time in their lives where they're adapted to living in water. They'll stay down here for about a month of growth, and then, well, it's time to be a land crab. They're very, very cute, <laughs> but there's a load of them. Like, this is the kind of load that puts other loads to shame. Right when people started removing the weird tire things for the big crabs, now there's a carpet of millions of baby crabs, and you can't step on them. <laughs> it's not easy to train for a marathon on Christmas Island, I'll tell you what. You gotta run with a leaf blower strapped to your crotch, <laughs> apparently. Now, if you have a lot of crabs about, check, then there's probably going to be a number of things that want to eat those crabs. I mean, cannibalism is a bit distasteful, but <laughs> you'll forgive an expecting mother a few dietary quirks, won't you? But a mama cannibal is the least of their worries. You'll see. You know what crabs is in German? Krabben. Excuse me. <laughs> I'm using Babel to, well, relearn German. It was my first language, but I recently went to Frankfurt to film some sea creatures, don't ask, and realized that my German skills have fallen to the level of a drunk eight-year-old. Die Wunde. It started a bit dark, but it is German. But that's what's cool. It's not Hans eats apples. It's real talk. You find Frau Wilbers on the floor, you gotta know how to help her. And that's what I like about Barrel. You can start off as a beginner without feeling babied, or dive right into something specific. Anwesend sein. Anwesend sein. And the speech recognition works. I know, I tested it. <laughs> blah, 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 blah. They've got a whole bunch of live courses, too. Like this one. Lerne verschiedene Kunstformen kennen und äußere deine Meinung dazu. That one's fully booked. It's why I need Babbel. I can say it, but I don't understand it. Babbel is one of the top learning apps in the world. What language do you want to learn? Click the link below to get 60% off your subscription. Danke. And now back to Krappen. Where were we? Oh, right. Sure, a mother might eat a baby or two, but what red crabs really have to worry about are these little bastards. Tens of millions of crabs on Christmas Island have been killed by them. They're called yellow crazy ants, not the good kind of crazy either. They're a type of formicine ant, like Dr. Adrian Smith's Formica archbolii here, which means that they spray formic acid out their butts. The ants will swarm the crabs and get the acid on their eye stalks and mouth parts and legs and all that, and they're screwed. But acid isn't the, sorry, butt acid isn't the only thing they have to look out for. They got this fucking thing coming down from above. I mean, it's not so much of a precision strike. Looks a bit like hunting for rabbits with a sledgehammer. Anyway, you've heard of this one. It's another land crab called the coconut crab. I mean, these things can get up to three feet across. And they're not just big, they're crazy strong. They can pinchy-pinchy with twice the force of a lion's bite. To handle that kind of force, the claws are made from this crisscrossing matrix of calcium carbonate. It's referred to as a plywood structure. <laughs> it's kind of lame, I'd call it dragon steel. Anyway, they're impressive, the largest terrestrial invertebrate. Look at that, they climb trees. But that's not even the surprising bit about them. You know it is. Their abdomen, which is sort of tucked under them, is leathery instead of having a hard shell. That's because when they're babies, they start out like this. <laughs> that's right, they're hermit crabs. 
They just kept growing and ran out of things big enough to fit that ass. Now, hermit crabs have a bit of a shell fetish, some more than others, but it isn't just about finding a shell that fits. A number of terrestrial hermit crabs modify the inside of the shells they live in, hollowing them out to make them roomier and lighter, but still strong enough to withstand the biting force of the things that hunt them. Now, as they molt and grow, hermit crabs need to move into bigger shells, and shells that have already been renovated are choice. So they'll often line up in what are called vacancy chains, which allows them to do their business quickly since it's a bit dangerous. And it means that most of the crabs get to move into a house with a finished basement, so to speak. I do think the one that inherited the shell with a hole in it got a bit shafted. But of course, if you're in a hurry and then don't have time to get in a conga line, the other option is to try and forcibly evict a crab from a bungalow you have your eye on. And this might be why crabs that renovate their shells have larger penises. Stay with me on this one. So when hermit crabs mate, the male tries to coax the female to emerge from her shell and expose, kids cover your ears, the middle region of her cephalothorax. Can't believe we didn't bleep that. Then the male deposits sperm on her, not in, on her, and she goes back in her shell and, well, does what she wants with it. Don't judge, you live in a shell your whole life. Kinky sex is all you have. Anyway, to expose his penis and deposit his sperm, the male has to partially leave his shell. And that means his shell can be stolen. And that's a normal thing to have to worry about when they get laid. So the theory is that crab species that invest more in their shells have proportionally much longer penises, as you can see here. So they can still hold on and protect their shells when they mate. Of course, hermit crabs aren't the only crabs that accessorize. The sponge crab, for example, is quite the milliner, or haberdash, whatever, they're into hats. They just happen to make them out of living animals in the phylum periphera, or sponges. The crab gets some stylish camouflage and the sponge gets to move about, which is great because sponges lack, well, pretty much everything. But like those terrestrial hermit crabs, the sponge crab isn't always content wearing things straight out the box. You've got to customize it, get the fit right. Here you can see a sponge crab work its magic on a commercial sponge. The crab not only cuts it down to size, but it also hollows it out so it sits just right on top the dome. I mean, the fit's not perfect, and still has to hold on with two little modified pairs of legs in the back. Now, some decorator crabs, like this one in the genus Hyastinus, also wear sponges, but not really as a hat. More like a full-body mascot for a banana stand. And that's what decorator crabs do. They put crap all over themselves and they don't need to use modified legs to hold on to what they're wearing. They're covered in a sort of Velcro, a specialized barbed seti that can hang on to whatever's the current fashion trend. And that includes some outerwear that'll f you up if you come in for an unwanted hug. Like coral polyps, they sting, or anemones like this one. Now, if you know your anemone anatomy, you'll know that they're shaped a bit like a bag. Come on, you've got to take advantage of that if you're a crab. A number of crabs in the genus Pagaropsis grow up with an anemone friend on their butts, and they can actually pull them up over their bodies like a blanket. And that's a cool thing for the crab. And of course, the anemone has a crabless mouth. Win-win. <laughs> or you can turn the anemone around and pretend you're a rocket. Look, I'm a rocket. I mean, but come on, this looks like two buddies having fun together. Like Calvin and Hobbes, <laughs> if Hobbes was firmly attached to Calvin's ass. Now, the boxer crab on the other hand, well, both hands reading, has a different relationship with anemones. They spend their lives carrying anemones in their front claws. It's pretty much impossible to find one that doesn't have these little pom-poms. Oh, look at the lips on that one. The claws seem to have been adapted to the job. They're fairly tiny, and they have these little pores all over them, which seem to be sensory, helping to make sure the anemone is being held in the right position. Of course, this means that those two front claws are out of commission for those normal claw activities. But remember, these aren't ordinary mittens. Here's a shot of an octopus right after it was just touched by one of those little stinging oven mitts. It's got a real get me the f out of here vibe. And here's a fish about to take it in the eyeball. But it's not just about defense. Those tentacles are grabby grabby. Look at that anemone and pluck that shrimp right out the water. And then look at the crab take it away. You know, he's got another set of claws back there. Look at him holding the anemone at arm's length while he munches. I mean, it's a bit f***ed up, but it gets worse. These crabs seem to intentionally starve the anemones to keep them just the right size. If you take them off the claws and let them eat normal, they grow big, even change shape. And to add injury to insult, you know what happens when a boxer crab loses one of those little boxing gloves? 
It friggin' tears the other one in half. I mean, they are good at regenerating, but still. I mean, you'd rather be a butt rocket, wouldn't you? Now, there is one time that the crab has to let go of its precious anemones when it molts and sheds its skeleton. You can see that transparent, newly molted crab behind its old body, and the first thing it does is to reach around and grab that pom-pom. Now, molting is a whole thing for crabs. Gotta crack yourself open from the back and shimmy out? It's complicated, especially the legs, for gosh sakes. It's a vulnerable time for a crab. It's like when you try to change a bathing suit under a towel on the beach, except the towel is the skin. I don't know. Just be glad you don't have to molt. Comes on all of a sudden and you're naked, wriggling on the floor of your cubicle. Janet from accounting comes in all, Oh, sweetie, is there anything I can do to help? No, Janet. Just leave me alone until I harden up a bit. And then you hear down the hall tell everyone Dave wants to be alone while he gets hard. And now it's just a countdown to when HR shows up and you're still trying to get your left toe out your old skin. Like this bastard here. Listen, <laughs> the point is, it's a time when the crab can't really move and they're all baby soft. And you've seen what we do to soft-shell crabs. At least hermit crabs can do it in the privacy of their own home. And some species bury their molts afterwards. The thinking is, is that they're trying to hide the evidence from predators that there's a newly molted delicious crab around. And they do a good job of it too. No one ever tells them that. Except me just now. I'm great. The spider crabs Leptomithrax giamardi make a whole production out of molting. Each year, thousands and thousands of these crabs make a trek from the deep where they live to the shallow waters off the coast of Australia. That's a lot of crabs and a long trip, so you can't blame one for sitting down, cross-legged, and having a little raw of our clam. When they get to where they're going, they form these giant pyramids of crab. I know what you're thinking, orgy, right? But it doesn't seem like that that's what they're up to. I mean, I'm sure there's a few of them diddling somewhere in the middle, but instead this seems to be a strategy to stay safe while they molt. They're like, come on, join the pile, it's safety in numbers. Uh, okay, but I'm on the outside. It's alright, just convince a couple others to cover you up, you'll be fine. It's like a literal pyramid scheme. But whatever they're doing seems to work, even with predators about looking for a soft bite. Now, molting doesn't just replace everything that's there, it can also regenerate a part of the body that's missing. And if we're on that subject, some male fiddler crabs have a secret. If you are one and you're watching, the jig is up. I'm ratting you out. Here's the deal. You may have noticed that the male fiddler crab has one really big f***ing claw, or BFC for short. Got a lifetime membership to the BFC Society. Now these claws have two main functions. One is to intimidate and potentially fight other males. They have burrows and a homestead to protect, and sometimes might be another male just talking shit. And for a fight, you probably want a big, meaty, muscular claw. But the other function of their BFC is, well, dating. Female fiddler crabs, whose claws are much more proportionate and well-suited to eating dirt, among other things, are attracted to males with big, long claws. But not just any crab with a big, long claw. A crab with a big, long claw that says, hey! And that's what the males do on a Saturday night. They wave and try to get a female over to the burrow. But it's not just the size of the equipment, it's the way that they wave that matters too. I mean, it varies from species to species, but generally a female likes a male that waves first. What can happen though is clusters of males all try to wave first and they end up waving in unison. Kind of backfires, so females also like males that get in some extra waves in between the group wave. All that waving can add up and you can see how for mating you'd want a long claw that's light. So you can keep waving until you get a date. So you can see there's two competing pressures on the size and weight of the claw. Male fiddler crabs seem to strike a balance between the two, strong enough to be effective and not get crushed in a fight, but long and light enough for attracting a mate. But there's things that like to eat crabs, and if your claws half your body, they'll probably go for that first. But crabs have evolved these breakage points designed to let the crab lose a leg or claw and make a getaway, like that one just did. Over the next few molts, that claw will grow back. Well, maybe not on that one. And about 40% of males or so have these regenerated claws. When they finish growing, they're just as long or even longer than the original, but they're not strong. So there's a bunch of males out there bluffing their way out of fights with what is essentially a foam finger, and then waving it around with less effort to attract the females, which don't seem to notice the difference. But now you're all busted. <laughs>
I'm sorry, baby. Everything's fine. Go back to bed. Jeez. <laughs> These crabs are out here. Come around. Whoa. Sorry, Timmy. You believe that shit? Oh, hold on. Hey! It is, Larry. It's the definition of bad sportsmanship. No, you're not. No, you're not just pinching my shaft. And don't, don't say that. It sounds wrong. God damn it, Larry.